Good. I've got a recording going. Great. The yeah, so it's it's good to be here with you. I uh I I talked earlier uh last week or, or so with uh with one of your colleagues, Eric Visner, and the trying to get an understanding of my big toe. I just wanted to see see how I, how I'm doing from that that way. How I is it would would this description be correct that there's some that there's a larger consciousness system in which we are participating in some way similar to uh to like John Wheeler's idea of the participatory universe whereby we're providing information to that system and the system itself is self-synthesizing and trying to reduce its logical disorder its entropy over time such that we can participate in it in ever more advantageous ways well that's uh that's it generally um the we are subsets of the source you talk source the larger consciousness system we are subsets of that just like um they call a virtual machine is a subset of a larger say mainframe computer may have a dozen virtual machines running in it uh they're all part of the same computer but they're they're subsets and they're independent in the sense that they have their own um uh, you know, their own processing and do things in their own way. They're kind of running their own, uh, their own game. So we're like that. We're subsets of this larger system. We are consciousness. And the way consciousness evolves is by lowering its entropy. So yes, we're engaged in, in interaction within the system with the purpose of lowering entropy, which turns out to be the purpose of uh, cooperation and caring once you move that up to social system status. Yep. And then is, so there's no ultimate separation between our individual consciousnesses and the larger consciousness system. No more than a, than a, 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 a virtual machine is separated from its mainframe. Yeah. There's some separation there, but it's, it's uh, imposed, not natural or not fundamental. Yeah. Right. And yeah. And and so would this be sort of my idea of conscious monism where they're there? The only thing in existence is consciousness in an ultimate sense. And then material reality is emergent from that essential basis. Yes. If you look at it that way, uh, material reality then is a is a virtual reality created by consciousness. And within that virtual reality then we were not talk about monism, everything, uh, everything being conscious, but outside of that, looking at it from the perspective of the larger consciousness system and, and us, then yes, everything is, consciousness is fundamental and everything else is a derivative thereof. Great. And then is that, that consciousness related to sort of the intelligence that you need in constructing a the universe? There are a lot of arguments around like net intelligent design that there would have to be a conscious creative faculty for a number of the things that we observe in the universe so how is from that larger consciousness system are you able to derive the rule set for space time and is there a sort of like feedback between the rules and what happens in the universe whereby the universe or the consciousness system is learning in some way or is it deterministic in the sense that there are just these rules and then things play out like a, like a computer program? Some of both. Um, yes, the, uh, you know, the way our reality comes about, it's, it's a virtual reality I mentioned, but it's not programmed. It's, you know, consciousness, the consciousness system, the larger consciousness system is an intelligent aware system. It's thinking, it makes choices, you know, just like we do. We're subsets of it, but we're smaller and have less uh, resources to work with, but we're very similar uh, to it. So it's somewhat like us. I guess it's better to say we're somewhat like it. But the way it created this reality is that it, it started with a rule set and a set of initial conditions. And that rule set and initial conditions then were allowed to evolve 
you know, according the initial conditions evolved according to the rule set when the run button was pushed. So you push the run button and the conditions start changing according to the rule set and then the system evolves. So if you want to think of that as a big digital bang, then the rule set is you know, a, a ball of plasma, high temperature, high pressure, uh, so on. And the rules, the rule set itself is, is uh, I mean, those are the initial conditions. The rule set is what we call science and basic uh, basic physics mostly and some chemistry. Then later on, some biology. But that all evolved from this uh, um, rather simple uh, rule set and initial conditions. Now, I think it probably needed a little uh, tweaking as it went along. I don't think, you know, that it uh, just happened. And from that particular uh, pushing the run button, it just ran and ended up with what we have now. I'm sure there were lots of trial and error. So you you talk about was there was there a building? Was there a learning process? Yes. So you know that process is why we have the the um, set of numbers that are referred to as a you know the anthropomorphic what principle I guess it's called. Basically, there's a bunch of cosmic conscious uh, constants that if you changed any one of them, even in the eighth decimal place, the universe would become unstable and wouldn't be able to be here. And the question is, how could those set of constants be tuned to each other like that, the eight decimal places? How does that happen? That isn't the result of a random, you know, random events. Random events don't tune five numbers to eight decimal places to just work with each other exactly. So, the way it works is that run button is pushed and that's uh, you know, big digital bang, take one. And that probably goes for a few seconds and blows up. And then you take big digital bang, you know, run two. And when you're on, you're on big digital bang, run 10,000. Well, now your, your, your constants are starting to come together. And eventually, yes, you, <clears throat> you uh, make something that is stable enough to evolve the kind of things that it needed to evolve. <clears throat> it had a purpose. It was evolving avatars for consciousness to play. So consciousness would have um, important, significant, uh, meaningful choices to make. So that's that's kind of how we end up with this physical virtual reality. It was evolved out of many, many tries with an intelligent consciousness system working toward a cause. So it could have gotten halfway through that process and decided, well, this is not working well. I need to fix this. I need to tweak that. I need to add something or take something away. So it wasn't just quite as pristine as, as maybe I make it sound. I'm sure there was a lot of tweaking in the, in the middle to make it work. We have similar kinds of programs running in computer science labs all over the place where they take initial conditions and rule sets and set them up and let them run and see what happens. And typically they do the same thing. They tweak it and play with it and, you know, uh, work with it to, to get the kind of results they're looking for. So you would affirm the strong and anthropic principle that the constants of physics and the rule set, the laws of the universe are specifically adjusted for the emergence of life and whatever the universe's other goals are yes the goals were particularly to create uh, <clears throat> valuable avatars <clears throat> for consciousness so yes that uh, they <clears throat> that uh, particular um, virtual reality was probably uh, you know stopped and started millions of times before you know trial and error well, not just dumb trial and error, but smart trial and error. You have an intelligent source. So then <clears throat> you have smart trial and error trying to produce something that works. Yes. So I agree with that strong anthropic principle that that uh, that's why we have these constants that are perfectly tuned to each other so that if any one of them changed in a minute change, it would make the whole system unstable. They had to evolve together. There's no other... Uh, hmm explanation for why you have that other than that they obviously evolved together with some intelligence 
tweaking them this way, tweaking them that way to uh, uh, make it work. Yeah, so I'm I'm trying I'm trying to get a good grasp on this. So the the logical rule set emerges in coupling with the universe in some sort of logical duel to the Big Bang, and then it is adjusted on the fly according to like these freely changing conditions in the universe. But ultimately, it's still striving towards the same thing. It's striving to create a habitable reality for conscious agents in the world, mm-hmm. and then in is there so and then I, I guess my question is this is something that john wheeler talks about in i believe his 1980 paper beyond the black hole it, with his idea of the participatory universe mm-hmm. is there a mm-hmm. is there a way that maybe we as those conscious agents are then further updating the rule set and participating in the structure and dynamics of reality well we participate in the you know, we participate in the whole thing, but not so much in changing the rules. The rules <clears throat> are there because they work. You know, the rules were, you start with an initial set of rules, but then those rules evolve to produce what it is we're trying to, you know, whatever the system is trying to produce. So at this point, it's it's been working long enough that that rule set is pretty is pretty stable itself it's not going to change a whole lot now it may change somewhat there may be things that uh, are will become sticking points in the future that rules will have to change so no doubt there'll always be some rule changes but i think that's not really with the way we participate so much uh is in changing rules we participate in the nature that this that this uh, reality goes, the whole reality, the larger conscious system and us in the virtual reality, playing in the virtual reality, we're creating something, we're evolving. It's not like it's a done thing that, you know, we're at the we're at the end game, just seeing what happened. We're in the process of creating a lower entropy, better place to be that that continues to lower its, lower its entropy more efficiently. So it's evolving toward end goals and <clears throat> where our participation in that is key um, the system evolves by lowering its entropy as we make good low entropy choices as we what i call evolve the quality of our consciousness which is the same as lower the entropy of our consciousness as we do that the entire system's conscious system you know with what contains us and everything else its entropy is lowered so we're part of that process of the whole thing evolving. We're, we're, we are part of the systems, uh, what can we say, uh, the systems plan for evolution of consciousness. We, the individuated units of consciousness, the, the, the subsets, we're a part of that plan and our own growth is a part of its growth. So yes, we're all, it is participatory, not so much in that we change the rules as it is we grow up, we lower our entropy, we, uh, we help the system and the system helps us evolve. And, that, and that's the, the purpose of the whole system is the proliferation of these sorts of conscious agents. Yeah, basically the system, its, its first job is to survive. It survives by lowering entropy. If it raises its entropy, it will disappear. All the bits become random. If it raises its entropy to the full, the fullest extent, all the bits become random, and then there is no information system. So it's trying you know, to survive, and it's trying to improve itself, and it's, it's, it's trying to create something that is stable and lasting and valuable. And that's kind of what it's what its mission is and we're just piece parts of that on our own journey to grow up lower our entropy and create something valuable in the space that that we operate in which primarily uh, is this virtual reality until we learn how to step out of that virtual reality then we can play in the larger reality but most of us most of us humans are kind of stuck in the virtual reality, at least for now. 
Yep. And is in in the in my big toe, is there a model? This is kind of a buzzword in modern physics of like retro causality of in some way that the future and the future can in some sense influence the past. So you could have that we are, even though things have already occurred in the universe, somehow the because the purpose of the universe was to create us as like observer participants and then we and then we're in some sense retro causally influencing the universe to become the sort of universe that would create something like us in order to lower its entropy over time uh i don't think so i i don't think that uh, that retro causality idea is 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 uh workable if you have that it has to be very tightly controlled or obviously the system kind of blows up and becomes becomes you know if you have too much feedback in a system the system tends to go unstable you can't have too much feedback so you know in a evolving system evolution just continues to work toward its goal and in this case, the goal is lowering entropy. Inside our physical virtual reality, the goal is survival and procreation. Those are the goals for our, our um, what we call the physical universe. But for consciousness, it's lowering entropy. And it just works toward that goal. It tries to create those situations that, as they evolve and, and, and continue on doing what they're doing, entropy is lowered. So it doesn't really, it, you know, the past is the past. Once it's done, it's done. You know, you can, all evolutions that way. If you look at our physical evolution inside this virtual reality, then it's the same way. You know, we don't uh, uh, somehow go back and modify the way the world evolved. Now, we can change it so that it evolves differently from here on, but it's not a retrocausal sort of thing. There are, Retro causality has a lot of logical problems with it. it you know, if you if you uh, can change the past, that then that past changes the future. You you have a feedback that very quickly gets out of hand and goes unstable. So I don't think that's a that's a feature. If something like that happened, it wouldn't be a feature. <laughs> it would be a flaw. It would be a problem that would need to be fixed. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. The And this sort of parlays into one of the topics that I want to talk about, which has confused me a little bit in a lot of the physics books that I write is on or have read is on the nature of time, because it seems to me that in so in in relativity, you have that the, this new idea that like time can't in any way be separated from space and position and you have this like big grab big geometric manifold where like everything is all all of the time and space coordinates are relative to one another and then and then with quantum theory you can't really speak intelligibly of time below the Planck's length unit of like 10 to the negative 44 seconds then our our metrics kind of break down and there's not really any metric continuity or subdividable interval below that so like what is, is there is there any way to restore the arrow of time in my in my big toe because in in physics the only three things that i'm aware of that we know to actually have an arrow of time in the sense that they're not time reversible processes is the increase of entropy which would be Kind of the opposite of what the universe is striving towards i guess in your model is that in a closed system entropy will always increase um the the what's it called the psychological arrow of time that we remember the past and not the future and then the accelerating expansion of the universe which always increases with time but is there any way to like really restore our common conception and experience of time in my big toe sure i think so uh, time is, in my big toe, it's a technology that was developed to help the system lower entropy. Okay, and I'll, I'll explain that. If In the very beginning, <clears throat> this larger consciousness system was not so larger. It, you take it back to its very beginnings, and it 
is you know the, the simplest piece of consciousness is basically a, you know a binary in the sense that it's a it's an awareness of being in state one or state two or state one and state zero and that is the simplest that consciousness can get you know it's a, it's an awareness it has to be aware of things it has to make choices consciousness is awareness with a choice that's my definition of consciousness and if you have a choice the most limited choice you can get is a binary you know can i be in state one or state two if there aren't two states it's could i be in state one or state one that's not a choice you're just in state one so that's the simplest consciousness now that's where the larger consciousness system started and it found that it could be in a state one, then state one again, then state two, and then state two again, then state three, or I mean state two again, and state one. And it can make patterns of ones and twos or ones and zeros. And as it evolved, it created order. Order is lining up the ones and zeros in particular order. That creates order that lowers entropy. Then as it continued to evolve, it made patterns of ones and zeros it made patterns of patterns and then as it started to level off its its uh, growth oh and i should say it also probably learned arithmetic because arithmetic is you know a math is very is very simple oh i've got two ones here and two ones there oh i that's four ones all together you know it's the, the idea of of uh, math is just unnatural falls out of that and out of out of addition, of course, comes multiplication, and out of those comes division, and out of those comes, you know, algebra. And you know, you can you can look at a big number crunching computer and and say that it really doesn't do anything but add. You know, it just uh, it's very fast that it's that it's adding. So in any case, the system got to a point where it was slowing down its evolution, and what it came up with is it used a one and a zero pair, one zero, one zero, one zero to make a metronome. And that metronome then defined regular time. Up until that point, there was, there was, let's call it primordial time. You could change, the system could change itself from state one to state zero. So that implies time. I was in one, now I'm in zero time. Okay, logically, three things have to, work together. One is consciousness, that's making the choice. That's the choice maker. Um, if there, if you have choice, you have time before the choice and after the choice. So you can't have choice without time. Now, if you have choice, then you also have free will because without free will, there is no choice. You know, it's all programmed. There's, there's no choice involved. So consciousness, which is a awareness that makes choices, consciousness, time, and free will all are concepts that all required for each other. You take any of those away and the other two cease to function. Okay, so we'll start there. So it decided that it could just make a one zero, flip back and forth, make a metronome, and that that was regular time, time that was spaced equal, you know, spaces between pulses. And with that regular time, now it could make sequences of patterns. You know, sequences of patterns of sequences of patterns, if you like. And by gaining more and more complexity, which is another way of saying order, it lowered its entropy. So regular, so time comes in just with consciousness. If you have consciousness, you have to have time. Consciousness is awareness with a choice. Okay, so those two just come in together. They're defined, mutually necessary for each other. And the my big toe starts with one assumption, only one assumption, and that is consciousness exists. The other sort of an assumption is that real is that uh, um, evolution exists, but evolution is is a logical necessity for consciousness. Yeah. So it really just is one one uh, uh, one thing that you have to start with, and that's that consciousness exists. All right. So now you have time and. You had, Primordial time was there uh, just because it had to exist for consciousness to exist. Then we have regular time, which allows sequencing and measurement in time because it's regular. And when you create a virtual reality, a virtual reality is created 
by a rule set and a clock. So let's talk about, you know, any virtual reality. It has rules, the way things have to interact, and it has a clock at the outer loop uh, that any, any model of a dynamic system, that's a system that can change, any model of a dynamic system uh, has an outer time loop. And it cycles through the calculations of everything happening every delta t. And then it's like it recalculates everything for the next delta t and recalculates everything for the next delta t. So the time in our virtual reality is just that. It's the outer time loop of the simulation that's simulating the, the virtual reality. There is a time loop. Now, that time loop can, can have a delta t that's bigger or smaller. Okay, it can, uh, it depends on the resolution that you need in time. Are there going to be measurements in this system that are looking at nanoseconds? Well, and, and, and are those measurements critical? Well, in that case, you need to have a time that's as small as, if not smaller than a nanosecond, if you're going to measure that. So it depends on the needs of the system, how big your delta T is and what your resolution is. Now, in our system, that we have we have delta Ts and, of course, delta Xs. Delta Xs are how much you can you move. What's the what's the quantum? What's the pixel of distance in which you can move? So we have pixels of time. I say pixels. Uh, you know, just using that word pixel, a lot of people understand that. You know, digital uh, uh, smallest smallest thing. So you have pixels of time, delta T, and pixels of distance, delta X. And as fast as anything can move through a virtual reality is one delta X for one delta T. Now, I, I mean move contiguously. I don't mean teleport. You know, If you leave this delta X and jump to some other delta X far away, that's teleporting. But if you're going to move steadily, contiguously through the space, as quickly as you can go through it is one delta one delta x for every delta t, which means every virtual reality has a speed limit. One delta x for one delta t. Now, you take delta x and divide it by delta t, and you have the speed of light. That's that speed limit. Okay, so that's why light speed is a constant. It goes with the, with the, uh, you know, the nature of the digital reality that you have to have a a speed limit. Now, you know, the world of Warcraft has a speed limit too. So do the Sims. You know, so does ma No Man's Sky. All virtual realities have to have a speed limit. It's the nature of being a computed reality. So what happens if you need more, if you need more uh, resolution, you can always get more resolution by decreasing delta X and delta T by the same amount. Right, so if I need more resolution, first of all, I should say, you don't run the simulation with any more resolution than you absolutely need, because that's just a waste of cycles. So you keep it as low a resolution as possible, but eventually, as people get smarter and make telescopes and microscopes and other things, you're going to need to increase the the resolution a little bit. When you do that, if you could change, if you could make delta x and delta t each smaller by the exact same amount, then the speed of light wouldn't change. But you can't make both delta T and delta X smaller by the exact same amount because it's digital. You can only get it to the closest, you know, pixel. Okay, if I had one, if I move that delta T just one more pixel over, it'd be too much, or one more pixel back, it'd be too little. So I have to do one or the other. I can't pick a point between pixels. So I have to get the best fit I can. If I want to divide, say, uh, delta T by 2 and delta X by 2, well, that may have unending decimal places behind it, you see. Yeah. So you run out of pixels eventually, and you have to make it approximations. Okay, so that's why the C, the speed of light, changes every so often just a little bit in, say, the ninth decimal place. You may not have been aware of that, but the speed of light is, you know, we measure it to like 15 decimal places, but every so often, I think it's happened now about four times, maybe five times, that the speed of light has actually changed a little in 
eighth, ninth, tenth, I don't remember, but in, around in that, let's just say ninth decimal place, not not very much, but enough that it's not measurement error. It's a real change in the speed of light. And of course, nobody knows why. Why does it do that? Why does it change that little bit? It's a real change because it's much larger change than you know the, the, what we can measure to. So that's another big paradox that this model solves. Yeah. Uh, you know, it uh, it changes because the system needs to up the resolution a little bit because those pesky people are are digging deeper and deeper into smaller and smaller things, and they need more resolution uh, to you know what they're what they're measuring. So that's that's kind of how. You know, so you're talking about time. So time is fundamental to consciousness. Time is a regular beat in a virtual reality. And our time is something that has been set to us with a delta T that measures our, our cycling through. Okay, now that's how we look at time. Now, when you're, when you're a, a, an avatar, you know, you're, you're playing an avatar here and the avatar wants to come up with time, they're going to find some physical cycling thing that they can peg it to like the amount of time it takes the earth to go one cycle around the sun and they're going to come up with some kind of a thing like that because that would be a natural thing to do take some cyclical thing and break it into pieces so you can define time you can define distance both out of that that process so that's that's where time comes from it's integral to a virtual reality as the as the delta t outer loop it's necessary logically for consciousness to exist. Now, here we are, we're conscious. So the fact that consciousness exists is not exactly uh, you know, a, a question that uh, should have to worry about too much. I mean, it's, I think it's pretty obvious. Yes, consciousness exists because here we are and we're conscious. So given that it does exist, then that's where time comes from. You have yeah, to have time. It, it worked. What's that? It, it worked. The system did the, did its job. Yeah. Yeah. Is the, uh, is the, I had kind of two questions from that. Is, uh, is the like changing of the Delta X metric of the position in between two points, is that related to, I don't know if you know this, but the, um, in 1933 in Arthur Eddington's book where he, is talking about the expanding universe. He puts out this kind of satirical proposal that you can think that you could also think of the universe as like a shrinking atom, that the contents of the universe are getting smaller relative to the system as a whole if you hold the size of the universe invariant. So is that why there is that rescaling of that metric? No, I wouldn't see any reason for that. That uh, that would just add extra, extra uh, complication you know, to the to the physics, to the rule set. There's really no point in that. It doesn't add anything. Um, the idea of an, of the fact that the size of the universe is is not only getting bigger, but it's accelerating. It's getting bigger and bigger, you know, faster and faster. That is simply part of the rule set. The rule set is made to make it's got a couple of points to it. You know, it's made to make everything work, right? Like you say, it works. It all fits together. That's, you know, you have to have a rule set that works. That's why those constants have to be so so uh, uh, perfectly uh, tuned to each other to make it work. Now, if the universe was, was uh, shrinking, well, we'd know that. And that would be a bad sign because eventually it would collapse in on itself. If it were traveling at a, at a, if it was expanding at a uniform velocity, well, that would imply a kind of, uh, um, you know, what did what did they say? The, um, what was it called? It was called the 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 cosmological constant. Yeah, you no, know, where where it expands out, stops, and then comes together and big, smashes. Big crunch. Yeah, the big crunch, right? You know, you end up with kind of a big crunch thing where it all slows down and then it comes back. And that was kind of debunked. And that's not a good idea. Our reality doesn't 
doesn't uh, do that. So what's left is that it's continually expanding and not, not slowing down. Well, if it's not slowing down, then it, then it expands at a constant rate, which requires some very, very specific physics to make that happen, which is, which is uh, you know, to keep that balanced just exactly at a constant rate. Or you can just let it accelerate, kind of a, an event that really doesn't require much work or anything particularly specific to go with it. So the universe just accelerates. When you have a, when you, when you have a virtual reality, right? If you were the if you were the larger consciousness system and you'd created this virtual reality, you could kind of make it do anything you you wanted, but you'd want to make it efficient. You'd want to make it work in such a way that it caused the fewest amount of calculations for yourself and that most efficiently supported what you wanted it to do, which was to be stable enough to produce good uh, avatars for consciousness to play with to give them better choices. So so the system makes it expand. You don't have to come up with, you know, fudge factors. I call them fudge factors. I don't know what they call them in the school you go to, but when you you can't get the right answer, but you know you're only a factor of two from it, you just stick a two in there and say, and we multiply by two, and we get the right answer. You know, that's called a fudge factor. You stick in a number to make the answer come out right. Well, that's basically what we've got going on with some of our, you know, dark... Uh, you know, our, our what dark stuff, dark energy. You know, dark, uh, dark matter. We have, we have the problem that we can't solve. We get the wrong answer. The answer isn't what we expect. We shouldn't be expanding. You know, that shouldn't it shouldn't be accelerating and expanding. And we can't explain why it would do that. So we make up something. We throw in a fudge factor and says, oh, well, there's all this invisible matter that nobody can see or touch or smell or taste or measure. And it's there. And it's, you know, gravitational pull is doing something or that I guess that's the dark energy. It's pushing, you know, it's pushing the, the universe out and making it accelerate. So those fudge factors are unnecessary. When you have a virtual reality, it can be, it can really do whatever is the simplest solution that doesn't take a lot of calculation to support. And I think in this case, it was just let it, let it expand, let it accelerate and expand. It's just math. The computer isn't going to run out of numbers. You know, it's uh, makes it an easy, an easy solution. And then to sort I, of, Okay. Yeah, I guess I guess another way to say that is everything in a virtual reality doesn't have to make sense. You know, there's some things in a virtual reality. You say, how do you tell that a virtual reality is a virtual reality? Well, one of the ways is that everything doesn't have to make sense. In a virtual reality, the, the one controlling that virtual reality can do things in that virtual reality that don't seem to have any explanation. You know, and we have we have things like that happen all the time. You know, sometimes we call those paranormal things, but sometimes we just, you know, some mother just knows that her son's in trouble. You know, well, where, how does that happen? You know, and we have lots and lots of, of instances of things that don't have a good explanation. Well, in a virtual reality, that 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 could be done, and that's one of the ways that you tell us a virtual reality there are things that don't make sense like the big bang where did that ball of plasma come from oh if this universe contains all reality well it didn't at the big bang that was outside of this universe the universe hadn't started yet so where did that big ball of plasma come from so that there's no answer for that it doesn't fit our our science doesn't do that the, where that comes from it doesn't do that easily without making up fudge, you know, fudge factors and things. So, avert that's a sign. That's one of the telltale signs of a virtual reality that you things just happen because they do sometimes, not often. Because to be a good virtual reality, it needs to be consistent according to the rules. But some things are outside the rules, like that ball of plasma. 
they're not contained within the rules. And the accelerating universe might just be one of those things. Be because the this the system, the larger consciousness system, can in some ways does have that freedom to make up those fudge factors mm -hmm. because it it generated the rule set in in the first place and it it's not that it just wants things to evolve deterministically but has specific goals that it's trying to achieve exactly sure and then is if we think play further with the analogy of like reality as a computer system or like a virtual reality game is there a sense in which there's this local time which is us in the in the physical universe which is all these things we've talked about it's discrete it's relative but then there's this like absolute time which is basically the same as like the programming of the universe that every every state transition every like t to t plus one it's um it's like enacting the the code of the larger consciousness system. Well, <clears throat> time happens naturally in consciousness, right? That's just a part of consciousness is choice, and choice requires time. So that's just a natural part of that system. In a virtual reality, then you have to have a clock that runs that virtual reality. If you have 10 different virtual realities, then you can easily have 10 different clocks. They don't have all have to use the same clock. They can use much different clocks. It depends on the purpose and the structure and how much detail you have within those realities what, and what the rules are. So time can be a lot of different things, places. It doesn't have to be, you know, the system is aware, it's conscious, it's intelligent. It, everything doesn't have to be a machine. You know, people tend to think of, of reality as some, some machine, some mindless machine that just somehow keeps cranking on all by itself. But that's not a good way to think about it. If you understand it, conscious, if consciousness is fundamental, let's put it that way, then it's not a machine. It's a thing that can think. It can think, it's a thing that can change. It can do things that are outside the rule set if it wants. It can do things entirely outside the rule set and allow those to happen right here because that serves its purposes. So that that is, uh, you know, it's not as buttoned down as everything is a machine and everything works like this and everything you can give a, a formula for everything that happens. Sometimes things happen just because it's better for the system and the system can do what it pleases with its virtual reality. Now it wants to keep its virtual reality looking real. So it doesn't do a lot of things that show. It tries to keep that as hidden as possible. That's what makes it a good virtual reality. You know, if you had a bad virtual reality, you know, it wouldn't be so much fun to play in it things would happen uh, unexpectedly. It would, it would be kind of a squirrely, goofy uh, virtual reality. You, you expect it to be orderly and to follow rules and not to break those rules. And our virtual reality is like that too. So when the system breaks a rule and changes things, it has to do it in such a way that nobody notices. Now, I don't know if that helps answer that question. If not, go ahead and ask it to me again in a different, a different way. No, I I think that's that's good, and and then this kind of sort of the answer sort of parlays into one of the other things I wanted to to get to, which is how do you how do you induce a a little toe, in other words, like the unification of general relativity and quantum theory with your uh from start starting from the the big toe which you've put out. Okay, well, that's real simple. Uh, if you look at, let's say, relativity, relativity exists primarily because C is a constant. That's the key idea in relativity. Once you get that the speed of light is a constant, then with a little algebra, you can do special relativity. It's just that simple. You know, it's just kin kinematics and... Uh, you can do the calculations and you end up with the, with the, what they call it, the Lorentz uh, 
you know, formulation such that now you have, uh, um, you know, the, the objects getting uh, shorter and shorter in their direction of velocity. You have, you know, the, the shrinkage, you have time dilation, and you have the, the fact that the mass increases as you go faster and faster. All those ideas in special relativity just fall out of the fact that C is a constant. Now, that is kind of the basis of relativity. After that, you, Einstein wanted to include gravitation. And in his gravitational model, he came up with a model that was geometric, a geometric model. And instead of Newton's model, which was masses attract each other, you know, GMM over R square, they attract each other with a product according to the product of the masses divided by the square of the difference between them, and, and then a proportionality constant G out in front. Well, he came up with a different model that said uh, you have space time, and space time is uh, is uh, let's say bendable, and when it's bendable, things kind of fall in. And the old uh, uh, example is like a trampoline. You know, you put a weight in a trampoline, and then after that, if you throw balls or other things in there, they all kind of circle around and and head inward, just like uh, they would in a gravitational force if masses attracted each other, like Newton said. But his his model was more general than Newton's model. Newton's model was a good model for two masses. Uh, Einstein is a more general model with his model. But still, his model and his concept of space-time is just a model. You shouldn't look at space-time and say, Space-time concept, that's it. That has to be the nature of our reality, and there won't be anything that replaces that because it's just a model. If we look at it geometrically this way, then we can explain gravity better. But that doesn't mean we're at the end of the road with, with you know understanding gravity. It's just because there's still problems with gravity. It doesn't, you know, Einstein didn't resolve them all. He just made them easier to work with. So relativity is is mostly created. You get relativity between space and time because C is a constant. That's what creates all the, the, the interesting facts about relativity with, you know, length contraction, mass growth, and so on, time dilation. Uh, and that comes from C being a constant. And C being a constant comes from the fact that this is a virtual reality. I already mentioned that. C is a constant because one delta X for one delta T is an upper speed limit. So that explains relativity. Now, what about quantum physics? You, quantum physics is explained because if this is a virtual reality, then it's ridiculous to think of it as being built from the ground up. You know, that first you create subatomic particles, then atomic particles, then atoms, then molecules. If you try to build this reality up out of subatomic particles and building up, it's a calculation that's impossible. You know, it's just too hard. No one would ever attempt to do that because from a computer science standpoint, it's just way too bulky. You know, way too many calculations involved. Just the simplest thing. Just you know, me lifting my arm up in the air, you know, look at all the elementary particles involved in that and uh, having to group those up. You eventually resort to probability and statistics, just like statistical mechanics. You know, you take the little things and you group them up into, into uh, probability and statistics is the way you have to describe that. So the, the, uh, the model, the virtual reality model is is modeled in terms of probability and statistics. You've got a rule set that is predominantly uh, deterministic. It's just a rule set, mostly deterministic. There's some probability in it because, you know, like radioactive sources put throw out particles in random directions. So there's some natural randomness involved in it, but for the most part, that's deterministic. But you let that rule set generate the probability distributions that describes what's going on in the virtual reality. And then you can 
you can make calculations of what's happening in that virtual reality by using those probability distributions. Instead of doing all the mass of calculations, you just reach into the probability distribution that applies to that particular action and pull out an answer, and that's the answer. So that makes the, the computations, uh, you know, I don't know, hundreds of magnitudes simpler if you do it with probability statistics. So as it turns out, our reality runs on probability. And the way it works is that, well, maybe I should say this another way. If you do it from the ground up, you always know what's going to happen next because you just let, you know, whatever all the state vectors of everything just progress one more delta T and that's what happens next. That's why if you do that, you've got a deterministic universe. If it's from the ground up, it's a deterministic universe. But in this, in this virtual reality, it's done with probability and statistics, so they needed a way to determine what happens next, since it's not going to fall out of determinism, because we're not using determinism. The way it's done is it looks at all of the possibilities of a particular event. What are all the possibilities of what happens to this situation? And then it looks at the probabilities of each of those possibilities. Then it does a random draw from the probability distribution of the possibilities. And that's what happens next. Okay, so that's how the system determines what happens next. Now, that is the core function of the rendering engine. It has to render this virtual reality. It has to know what happens next. You make a measurement, what do you get? What happens next? You dig a hole in the ground, what are you going to find? You know, what happens next? You look through a telescope but that looks further into the universe than anybody's ever looked before. What are you going to see? Well, you got to know what happens next. So the way that that works, random draw from a probability distribution of the possibilities. So they have the probability for each possibility. Now, once you understand that, quantum physics makes perfect sense. You don't have this, this big, you know, no, nobody understands. How is it that particles are probability distributions? How does this probability distribution turn into a physical particle? You see, you have this big mystery in quantum physics that nobody understands. What does it mean that the probability distribution, you know, collapses to a physical particle? That doesn't make any sense. Probability distributions are mathematical entities. <laughs> mathematical entities don't collapse into physical particles. You know, it makes no sense at all. But the nature of our reality is that it's probabilistic. It's not a grounds up, deterministic, materialistic thing. So that viewpoint, you know, you just change that viewpoint from the grounds up materialism to a top down probability model, then you see that, of course, that's how you model particles. You, they're probability distributions. That particle has a probability of being somewhere, and and here are all the possibilities of where it could be, and here are the probabilities, and you take a random draw from that, and that's where it shows up, you see? And that's the way everything is computed here. So what it does is it, it gives a good, solid, logical explanation for quantum physics, why quantum physics is the way it is. It solves the what is this, you know, probability turning into material particles thing? You know, well, that's not what's happening at all. You know, it's just the nature of the way the reality is done. So what we've done is we've taken one greater model, one uh, over, what do we call it, um, one higher level model, and we've deriv we've we've done a derivation of quantum physics and why it works that way, and of relativity, why it works that way. Relativity is basically works that way because the speed of light's a constant. And, and relativity, I mean, uh, quantum physics works that way because this is a, a, probabil a probability-based reality frame. So if you have an overview that you can compute both quantum physics and relativity from, then that's the big toe Einstein was looking for. He was looking for that big, more general idea from which you could compute both relativity and quantum physics, because they know that, you know, relativity and quantum physics have some philosophy problems between them. 
each one of them has a has a, a tenet that is not you know that is contrary to the tenet of the other one they're, they're philosophically incompatible i guess we should say they've been trying to unify it for a long long time and they can't because it's it's basically they're not compatible so einstein and others knew that neither one was the answer there must have been something larger up above them some higher level of generality that you could derive both of those from and that was the toe he was looking for, that greater understanding from which you could derive both. Well, this is it. This particular toe derives both relativity and quantum physics, right, out of first principle. So that's, that's the little toe that Einstein was looking for. But besides that, it also does a whole lot of other things. It also genera uh, generates a science of the subjective world as well as a better science of the objective world. So that's a whole new science we didn't have before. So now you can understand how the subjective world works from a scientific viewpoint and uh, understand how, better understand how the, the objective world works from a, from a more general viewpoint. So that's basically what a toe is for. It's an overarching understanding that explains everything else. Yes. So could I could I try to do what I what I did at the beginning of this where I tried to like ex explain your your big toe in a way that you that you would agree with. Could I try to do that for like for the little toe for the unification of those two and see if my understanding is correct. Okay. Yeah, so so the the idea so is the idea basically that you know, in in relativity, there gra gravity is arising as a result of space time curvature. But in in my big toe, it's something more because there there's all these missing variables. Like you can't account for for like you said, like we try to put it fudge variables and put in like dark matter and dark energy to account for the expansion of the universe. So there's something like a positive the the logical dual of a positive cosmological constant that's expanding the universe over time that doesn't have to do with matter uh, and it's like perturbations that and then gravity arises locally out of out of something a little bit more sensitive than just it's like curving all of the other matter around it but that it's informing the larger system on how to display the universe in a way that's in accordance with what we'd expect from general relativity. But it, it's sort of a different causal relationship where the mat where the matter goes directly to the consciousness system, which then changes it. Like, so there's a sort of like black box where it's like going uh, input is from the matter. And then the output is back to the matter uh, or to the universe. And then, and it's also, I'd, I I'd guess a little bit more sensitive maybe to quantum effects because the because you you said that there's this ability for the value of c to change ever so slightly so it's taking into account the these like slight deviations and then for quantum and sorry if I'm rambling but I'm I'm just trying to understand this is that quantum mecha quantum mechanics is the quantum wave function collapses like there's the particle is generating a space of probability and then it and then the the system is selecting one of those states as not as the result really of a collapse or a decoherence from like observation but just through the ongoing evolution of the universe and then so and then those two they don't really need to be united maybe in the same way that a lot of people who want like a physical theory of everything are saying because they're just too because they're talking about two different scales of reality which are not necessarily in mutual contact because one is very big and one is very small but are in common contact with the larger consciousness system i think you've kind of <laughs> wandered around in it pretty well but you know, th think of it also from this direction. It'll simplify it a bit. There is no matter. 
Okay. There is no such thing as matter. Matter doesn't exist. There's no more matter than there than there are uh, you know, tables and chairs and refrigerators in a Sims game. They don't really resist. It's it's calculated. Okay. So you know, we use the word as if. So it, as if there was gravity. It's calculated as if gravity were a thing. It's calculated, you know, as if, you know, you can put in there whatever you want, but the system can can do it multiple ways. You know, it can it can it's a it's a it's a computer computing the reality. Okay, so now how does the system compute a table in the Sims? Well, it it takes out the volume of space that's for the table and doesn't let people walk through it. You know, it it uh, you know they bump into it rather than walk through it. You know, it has a bunch of rules that enable that table to exist as a solid thing in that virtual reality. Okay, but there is no matter; it's just calculation, as if there was a table there, as if there was gravity. You see, so it's it's all it's all calculations. There really is no gravity. There is no uh, force. You know, we take a, a charge here, a positive charge, and then we take another positive charge. Well, my hands, you can't see them. One here and another one over here. And we know they're going to repel each other. And we can write down the equations for that. But the particles aren't repelling each other. The, the, the simulation is being computed as if the particles repel each other, because that's according to the rule set. So, you know, when, once you think of it differently, like that it's it's the system isn't a bunch of physical things interacting with each other it is a computation and it's a computation that has to abide by a rule set so part of that rule set works out logically that two charges that are the same charge will repel each other part of the rule set so the way it shows that is one here and one here and there's a force between them pulling them apart Okay, that doesn't mean that there's a, a field that generates from one across to the other one, and that field interacts with the other one. That's us trying to give it some kind of a physical explanation. But that's not what's going on at all. There are no fields. Fields don't do that, you know. And of course, we have electric fields. That's why we're able to sit here and talk over electronic things, you know, electronic fields. It's being broadcast. It's being received. It's being sent through. Oh, yes. It's as if there were electrons, as if the world worked that way. You have a rule set. The rule set helps you create this physical reality. Then you compute that, that world according to the rule set. You apply the rules. But there really is no mass. There really is no universe. So it just appears to be accelerating because that's the way it's calculated. So once you kind of get that mind frame, then it makes a lot of other things kind of fall into place. And there's more than one way for a computer to compute something. You know, there's, you know if you're going to compute a, a solid table, there's in a, in a Sims game, there are different ways to do that. Now, the way they probably do it now is probably by uh, some sort of, uh, you know, a vector methodology, because that's more efficient than just keeping track of all the data in big files and, and looking in the file to see whether he's close to bumping into it or not every time he moves. You know, that's just not a smart way to go about it. But there's lots of different ways that things can be calculated. Doesn't have to even always be the same thing. Some things are more efficient to calculate this way. And in different situations, that same thing might be easier to calculate a different way. It depends on the, you know, the situation. So it's just that things happen according to the rules. That's why positive charges repel each other. That's part of the rule set. That was necessary in order for us to develop a stable universe. And after millions of tries, trial and errors to get a stable universe, all those rules were kind of figured out. Right? They along with all the constants to 10 decimal places and all the rest of this was kind of figured out what the rules needed to be to produce that stable universe. So here we are. Now we have all these rules that were generated uh, 
Uh, one, because the system's intelligent and not stupid. And two, a lot of trial and error to see what worked and what didn't. And because the, the system is very good at mathematics, because, you know, if computer's good at anything, it's good at mathematics. You know, that's basic, uh, you know, that's kind of fundamental language for computers is, is logic. And mathematics is just the logic of quantity. So um, think of it in that kind of a big picture. And I think then it'll all kind of fall together more easily. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank, thank you. That that clears up a lot of things that I, I was thinking about. Um, I, I get, I guess I've kind of gotten to, to most things that I, I want to talk about, I guess, like just before we wrap up, I, I like to ask this to, to all my guests, just like, what is your, what is your advice, advice for me for, you know, just in general? Well, what are your goals? What do you want to do? What's, what's your, what's your, your point? Where where do you uh, project your future to be? You know where do you want it to be? Yeah, I mean, I I I think it's uh it's a lot of the a lot of the same same sort of work that that you do of continuing to share and spread and make presentations on on reality theory and build you know institutions schools and teach this and really really try try to get to the to this idea that like. And I think this is inherent in your your model as well as that, like we're all expressions in some in some sense of the same ultimate universal identity. And so really, I think that's a shared basis of it doesn't not only is it immoral to, you know, have hatred and division, but it's but it's also illogical because you're basically doing that to yourself and that there's some something fundamental about love and unity to the to the structure of reality and existence and if we're, and if we're we're able to come together around some sort of sort of unified model around that you know i've i've taught and for like the last year or so on the on the ctmu on the cognitive theoretic model of the universe which i think is a, is very good it which i i think is basically rationally proves a lot of those statements is that then we'll we'll hopefully be able to think of how as part of if there is this specific purpose to reality how should we have and then we're able to rethink our education our economy our governments in a way that's actually consistent with what reality and the larger reality system is trying to achieve right you know once you understand reality well particularly in the, you know, from the, the MBT, the My Big Toe model, is that it tells you a lot of other things too. It doesn't just do better physics, but it tells you like, what's the difference between right and wrong? Well, right and wrong can be determined in terms of entropy. If what you're doing is tending to raise the entropy in the system, you know, in yourself and in the system, because you're a part of the system, then that's not good. If it in the long term, you know, lowers entropy, then that is good. So, you know, good and bad, right and wrong, those, you know, morality kind of falls out along with an understanding of, of the reality. So it's not a thing that people make up that then they impose. It's a natural part of the reality that you live in, that, uh, that that's the way things are, that are. So any good toe should explain a lot more than just science or just relativity and quantum physics, a good toe needs to explain everything. It needs to tell you, you know, what's, what's morality? What's, uh, you know, how do we know right from wrong in the, in the long term? And it reduces to, you know, the whole point of this consciousness system is to lower its entropy. The point of us is to make choices in this virtual reality so that we can more easily grow up, which means change our entropy, lower our entropy. So that's that's the point of it. And then yes, the point comes to well, kindness, you know, cooperation, caring. That's that's low entropy choices. You know, fighting, grabbing, you know, greed, all that stuff creates more and more dysfunction. So that's high entropy choices. So it, the, the system needs to tell you more than a better physics. It needs to explain everything. 
what's morality, you know, what's ethical, um, all of those things, you know, what's the purpose? Where are we, you know, where are we headed? Where, you know, what, what's the end, what's sort of the end game, you know, where are we going? So it needs to explain everything. Now, I, any things that I would give you uh, advice on is that you should be skeptical of everything. Always be skeptical of everything. And when I say that, I'm not accepting myself. I include me in that. You need to be skeptical of the things you, you hear from me. You need to be skeptical of everything. And instead of being driven to either believe or disbelieve things, you should just put things aside and say, well, I don't have enough information yet to know whether that's true or false or good or bad. So I'll just set it over here on the side until I find out more information. So right now I'll give it a, you know, a, a probability of 0.3. Eh, possible, maybe even sort of likely, but not that likely. <laughs> I'll give it a 0.3. You know, where a one is absolutely perfect and a zero is, you know, doesn't exist. So you you just set it there, 0.3 or 0.9 or wherever you make a judgment. And as experience comes through in your life, you shift those probabilities around. Oh, well, I found out a little bit more of that. I'll change that 0.3 up to a 0.5. That's more credible now because I learned some things. So go through life without making a lot of choices because you feel driven to, to either believe it or not believe it, because we don't like uncertainty, accept uncertainty, be, you know, deal with certain, deal with uncertainty gracefully, allow a lot of uncertainty in your life, because most of your life is going to be uncertain. And you need to be okay with that. Uncertainty should not create stress. Uncertainty is, is the way our life is almost all the time. Same with our ideas. So if you can live with uncertainty, then you won't have to jump to conclusions. You can just give things probabilities of being right or wrong, and you can shift them as you learn. And that way, you're what I call open-minded. Anything's possible. You know, you don't know all the facts in the universe. So you could be wrong on all sorts of things. You know, anything's possible. But not everything is likely. So you 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 have an open mind to look at pretty much everything, but then you put those things down on a on a on some kind of probability scale how likely they are from what you know now. But you don't have all hardly any ones or zeros. Very few things that you shut off, because as soon as you have a one and a zero, you're no longer open to taking in new information. You say, "Oh, I got that already. That doesn't exist," or "I got that already. That that's a sure thing." So you stop looking at new information. You stop wondering about it, and you get stuck in that, and that becomes a belief. And belief is the enemy. You want to believe nothing. Don't believe anything. Be skeptical of everything. Open-minded skepticism. Now, if you do that, if you keep open-minded skepticism, you will slowly converge on your best, your best shot at the right answer. You know, you'll converge on that eventually over time. And that's good. That's really all you, sh you should do. Now, if what you want to do is understand the nature of reality and help teach that to other people, then read, read all of them like you're doing. You know, be open to, to all the viewpoints and which ones seem to cover you know, the most, which ones give you the most value. And this is how you judge, and all of them are theories. This is how you judge a theory. If somebody comes out with a theory or a model, they're both the same thing. Model and theory are all the same thing. If you come out with a, with a theory or a model, you judge it based on how well does it answer and describe everything that we already know. You know, can it tell you why the speed of light's a constant, for instance? Can it, you know, can it describe the things we know? How much things that we don't know can it describe? Can it predict? Particularly things that within we can find out to see whether that prediction was right or not. And lastly, how many assumptions does it have? And what kind of assumptions are there? You know, if you give 
if you give any science uh, a large number of, uh, you know, what uh, aces, you know, as a poker or, uh, you know, free cards, you know, a card that can be anything. If you, if you give them that, then they can, they can explain anything easily if you give them enough assumptions. That's, what's, that's the problem with string theory. We have string theory, but every time they say there's a new dimension, that's just another assumption. So if you can't explain anything with 14 assumptions, then you're not trying very hard. You know, if you've got if you've got that many wild cards in the deck that you can make them be anything you want, you know, an assumption. You can make up any assumption you want. Come up with an assumption, you know, or you can explain anything with enough assumptions. So that's Occam's razor that says anything fundamental ought to be simple, straightforward. Now, complex things are built on top of foundations, but the foundation needs to be straightforward and simple, elegant in, in what it does and understanding, you see. So you can get lots and lots of complexity, but that complexity is not fundamental. If it takes three pages of math to describe something, you're not describing something fundamental. You're describing some kind of logical consequence of some bunch of assumptions. If you if you're looking for things fundamental, like what's the nature of reality? See, that's fundamental. Then the answer should be simple and elegant and have very few assumptions. The fewer, the better. And if you're like that, if you're skeptical and if you uh, are open-minded and you don't believe anything and you realize that anything that's really complex is probably not the right answer if you're looking for things fundamental. That's, it's the answer maybe to some other problem, but not what's fundamental. So if you, if you do that, then you'll get to where you want to go. And you'll get there with the wisdom and the understanding to help you really make something big of it. So those are just the basic things, you know, to answer your question, you know, how should you think? How should you be? Where should you go? Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't at all tell you to, oh, you should, you should, you know, look at my big toe and see that that's the real one, you know, well, no, that's not good advice. Look at everything. Decide what it is. You know, you have to figure all that out for yourself and don't believe anything because if you believe it, it's not yours. If you just believe it because somebody tells you, well, if you had to explain it, you'd have to go find the person that told you, get them to explain it because you just believe it. You see, that's why belief is useless. You know, you have to figure it all out on your own. So even if you take somebody else's model like mine or anybody else's, you have to figure it out and justify it and go through it and make it your own before it's yours. So that's my advice to you as a young guy, uh, you know, with a bright mind trying to trying to help uh, help the world find a, a better way of being and existing together, which is really what you're doing, you know, because these big pictures will affect everything. They affect how we treat each other. They affect how we see each other, how we see ourselves. And all of that will change everything. These are ideas that that uh, if you if you can. If you change the foundation, you change everything that's built on that foundation. And our culture and our world and our science are built on a foundation that really is wrong. Materialism cannot answer the questions. Materialism can't explain the double slit experiment. It can't explain a lot of things. It can't explain anything in the, in the mind world. You know, it can't explain anything paranormal. It can't explain anything in the, in the uh, perceptional. It can only explain things that are objective, measurable, objective things. Well, that's a small subset of, of our reality. You think of everything in our reality that's meaningful and really important to you, you will find that the small part of that is the objective world. All right, cars and houses and buses and streets are all important, but what's really important to you is relationships and caring and you know significant others and family, and there's lots of things that have a lot more importance than stuff. So having a science of the stuff, well, that's nice, but you really need a bigger picture than that. You know? And if science is nothing but a picture of the stuff, then your science is incomplete.
it's it's not really telling you the things that are important for you to understand. So that's a, you know, that again, foundations are simple. I mean, that's just an obvious, simple thing to understand. The important part of your life is not objective. It's subjective. Well, what are the rules in the subjective world? What's the science there? You see, that's important. So anyway, that would be my my advice, uh, Tom, is to, uh, or maybe you go by Tommy. I went by Tommy until I was older, and then I turned into a Tom or a Thomas, and you'll probably do the same, but I'm also a junior, so my, my dad had the same name. So it was a little confusing if we both had the same had had the same name, but that would be the advice I'd give you. And I think if you follow that, just general advice, you will end up exactly where you need to be, wherever that is. So keep keep up the work. And if you want to get a, a PhD in physics on the way, that's probably a good thing because the things that you you say will have more credibility. If you have that, at least they'll have more credibility in the physics world, which is where the change has to come from. I don't know if you've you've read enough of my work to know that I call the physicists the high priests of Western culture, but uh, they do fill that role. They tell everybody else, you know, what's true. That's the role of the high priest to tell people what's true. And now, and we have a very uh, deterministic, uh, materialistic culture, and the physicists are the high priests of that culture. So, a lot of what they think. Is part of, is is the reason of why we are the way we are, the way that people are, self-centered, greedy. A lot of that is because only the physical reality matters, and everything else is an illusion. Well, it doesn't matter if you rip people off because that's just part of the illusion. You see, it it makes a difference of how the world is. So you get these big ideas right, and it won't only change science, but it'll change the culture. It'll change the attitudes. It'll change the way we live and relationships and everything that really needs to be changed much more importantly than changing science. And we need to change science too, but that's not where our problems are. Our problems come from self-centered and greediness and, and uh, hostility and anger and all that sort of stuff. And that's what needs to be changed. So as you look for this, this big picture of reality, uh, realize it needs to be simple, it needs to be straightforward, and it needs to explain everything, not just science. It, and that's more important, really, than changing science. So I don't know whether that's been helpful or not, but uh, that's my take on it. Awesome. Thank, thank you so much. That's uh, it's It's been an honor. Thank you for for coming to speak with me uh did, did you want this to uh to go up on your channel or on my channel both let's spread it as far as you know wherever there's interested people helping those interested people see bigger pictures is a good thing so put it up on your channel and i can put it up on my channel if you'd like to put it on yours first to give your people a first look at it i can wait uh but i have did you make a copy of it uh, no, you but you can send me the recording tonight. Okay. Should be good. Yeah, yeah. The recording, of course, will be big, but I'll send you a link. Yeah. I'll put it on. I put it on uh, Google Drive. Send you a link to it. You'll be able to download it. Awesome. Thank you. It might, take... might take me a couple of days, but I'll I'll get it done. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. You're welcome. Have a, have a good night. You too. Good meeting you, Thomas. Yeah. Likewise.